Are you ready to go to work? We're going to have some fun today. How many like to be blessed? How many, if you had more money, there's that dirty word that you don't like to hear in church, but how many, if you had more money, things might be a little better at your place? Anybody? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 10, 19, that money answers everything. So I'm going to show you today how to get more. It's not a motivational speech. It's from the Bible because God wants us blessed. We started a 90-day tithe challenge this month on the first of the month. And uh, there are normally three reasons people don't pay tithes. Number one, they don't know they're supposed to. They didn't read the Bible. Maybe they weren't raised in church. They didn't know they were supposed to. As uh, Valerie was saying a little earlier, when she came into the marriage with uh, Ricky, she didn't know that. That was not something she was taught, so she just didn't know. So one reason people don't pay tithes is they just don't know. Before you leave today, you will know what the Bible says about tithing. The second reason people don't pay tithes is they're afraid. Fear. They're afraid that they can't. And we live in a society and a culture where uh, we, receive, we are inundated with advertisements of buy now and pay later. Zero percent interest for 24 months and all these kinds of things. And now uh, bankruptcies uh, abound everywhere. And let me tell you, don't, don't go bankrupt. Don't file bankrupt over $1,500. People file bankruptcy over $1,500, $2,000, $3,000. Don't file it at all if you can help it, but don't file it over something. You can pick up enough cans on the sidewalk, on the highways, and raise enough money to pay that $1,500. Don't file bankruptcy. It messes you up. That's another message for another time. The third reason people don't pay tithes Number one, they don't know they're supposed to. Number two, they're afraid. Number three, they think it all belongs to them. It's theirs, and they just plan not to pay tithes. I'm just not going to do it. Spirit of rebellion. And the Bible says rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. But I'm going to show you today from the Scripture what God has to say about your finances in you and how He wants to bless you. You see, this is God's plan to bless you. God doesn't need our money. Oh, you didn't hear me. God doesn't need our money. I mean, his streets are paved with gold. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is his. So he doesn't need our money. But he wants to bless us. And the means of blessing is he wants us to learn the principles of stewardship, which I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm actually going to talk to you about a trust fund. What is a trust fund and how does it work? And what kind of trust fund does God have set up for us? So let's talk about that just a little bit. And let me ask you what trust is. Trust can be defined as faith, hope. When you rely on somebody, when you have an expectation in something or somebody, you have confidence in something or somebody, that's trust. You believe in somebody. You trust them. You believe in them. That's what trust is. And we're going to talk about the trust fund. So on your life scale, let me ask you the question. Do you trust God with your family? How many trust God with your family? To protect your family. Wherever they go, whatever they do. Especially if you've got kids that have gone astray just a little bit and they're working on their testimony. We better be trusting God with our kids, right? Because they want to sow some wild oats. They want to do their own thing. Not a good, not a good idea. But if they decide to do that, we better trust God with our kids. And then God wants us to trust Him with our relationships. He wants us to trust Him with decisions that we make. And it's easy to do that. We can trust God with family, with relationships, with decisions, with health. But when it comes to money, we want to hold it. We don't want to trust God with our money. But I'm going to show you in the Scripture how that can be such a blessing to you. I love this Scripture in Proverbs chapter 3. Beginning in verse 5, here's what it says. Trust the Lord completely. Don't depend on your own knowledge. With every step you take, think about what God wants. What if we did that? What if every step we took in life, every decision we made, everything that we did, what if we just thought, God, what do you want? I know what I want, but God, what do you want for me? What do you want for my life? What decision do you want me to make here? With every step you take, think about what God wants, and He 
will help you go the right way. So if we think what God wants, if we ask what God wants, then we can trust Him to lead us in the right direction. How many of you believe today that God wants what's best for you? Do you believe that? How many know that without a shadow of a doubt? You know that God, the God of the universe, wants what is best for you. I believe that. I know that. I've seen it proven over and over in my life. So if He knows what is best for us, and He wants what is best for us, then... I need to listen to him. I need to follow his rules. I need to follow his direction and see what he will do. In Psalm 118, it's like this. It is better to trust in the Lord than to trust in peeps. Your peeps will mess you up sometimes. They will lie to you. They will turn on you. They'll become a Judas to you. People will let you down. Preachers will let you down. Presidents will let you down. Congressmen will let you down. The mayor will let you down. You'll be disappointed in court sometime. Your spouse will let you down. They will disappoint you. Y'all not shouting much today, are you? But let me tell you something. God will never fail you. So it is better to trust in the Lord than to trust in people. People are not your source. People are not your answer. And many times they mean well and they want to help you. And there are a lot of great people in the world and in the kingdom of God. And they want to help us and we want to help them. But God is the one that will never let you down. He will never fail you. So let's look at what a trust fund is. From a secular standpoint, a trust fund is money or assets that belong to one person. But it's legally held or managed by another person or another organization. It's where money is kept. And for tax advantages sometimes and for accountability, there's many reasons that a trust fund is set up. A fund manager or the steward, the person that manages a trust fund, is the person or persons, or maybe it's an organization with people in leadership, but they are responsible for implementing the fund's investing strategy and managing its portfolio activities or if the case may be to distribute funds to someone. Maybe it's a minor. I read a, When I was working on this message, I read about a lady that uh, she was blogging about being a trust fund baby. And tragically, her father was killed in a bad automobile uh, accident. They had a large insurance policy. And so a trust fund was set up for her. So when she turned 16 years old, she said her mom wrote her a brand, wrote a check for a brand new car. And she began to tell the story how from the time she was 16 until her late 20s that she went through money like it was water. Anything she wanted, it, was, it didn't matter. Extravagant. She didn't say how large the trust fund was. She just said she was a trust fund baby and she had everything she needed. How many could, uh, you could get into having a large trust fund at your disposal anytime you needed money, you just write the check. How many could get into that? Well, I've got good news for you. I have great news for you. God, the God of the universe, has established a trust fund for you, for you to manage. And here's how it starts out, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 26. The earth, planet earth, is the Lord's. And most of the things in it are His, except that stuff that you claim is yours. Oh, did I miss that? The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it and on it. Do you get it? You thought you just lived in your house. You thought you just drove your car. If it's not yours, whose is it? It's God's. And see, a lot of times we don't, we don't get that. We don't understand that. I mean, we read it and we hear it, and we, we, but, we, but we still think... Everything we have, I worked hard for it. It's mine. It's it's my car. It's my house. These are my clothes. But the truth is, the earth is the Lord's. And everything on it belongs to God. So it's not yours, is it? It's, It's not mine. This is not my building. This is not Metro Tab's building. It's the building that God lets Metro Tab use. That's all it is. 
the house I live in, it's not my house. It's not even the bank's house, even though there's a mortgage on it and they think it's theirs. God could change that in a moment. It's God's house. He's just letting the bank make a little interest on it while I live there. Do you understand? So the earth is the Lord's and everything in it is the Lord's. And if we can get that, if we can understand that we are only stewards, we're only managers, that God has allowed us, He has trusted us with certain things, with certain assets, if we can understand that, we get set up to be blessed. He, he has set us up to take us to another level if we will just understand His principles and what He is saying. Let me give you a scripture. Luke 12, verse 42. Beginning in verse 42. The Lord said, Who is the wise and trusted servant? Are there any wise and trusted servants here? Because he's, he's a, that's what the Lord is saying. The wise, who is the wise and trusted servant? Because the master, he trusts one servant to give the other servants their food at the right time. Who is the servant that the master trusts to do that work? When the master comes and finds him, finds that servant, doing the work he gave him, it will be a day of blessing for that servant. Did you get that? See that in blue. When the master comes and he finds the servant that he gave work to, when he finds him doing the work he gave him, it will be a day of blessing for that servant. I can tell you without a doubt, the master will choose that servant to take care of everything he owns. You want more? Take care of what you got. No, that's bad English. Take care of what you have. Whatever you have now, take care of it, tithe on it, be a steward over it. Understand, it's not yours anyway. It belongs to him. And if you'll take care of that, he'll give you more. He'll bless you. He'll increase you because he knows he can trust you. I mean, if, what, if, what if God spoke to you right now and said, give your car to Ricky DeVore? Because he gave away the money he had for a car. Because God said, give it away. He didn't say to God, this is my money. I'm not giving it away. This is mine. He didn't do that. He gave it when he needed it for a car. But when he obediently gave it away, God brought a car into their hand. That's the way it works. Does that help anybody? Y'all are shouting today. I can tell you, you are happy today. So God has set up a trust fund for you to manage, and you are the trustee. You are the steward. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Let me tell you, being a steward and having privilege over things is a lot better than owning it anyway. I've owned some things, man, I thought it was mine. Bills came, maintenance repair bills came, expenses came. I'm thinking, God, I can't pay for all this. But when I realize it's his, I say, God, here's the bill. What you going to do about this? You, you got some bills here, God. They need to be paid. You're marring your credit. Hello? And he just, he just takes a little chip of gold from the streets and just brings it down, and the bills get paid, amazingly. But you are the trustee. You are the steward over the trust fund. And 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2 says, It is required in stewards that one be found faithful. You are a steward, and he is depending on us to be faithful over what we are to steward. Now, let's look at this scripture. This is the scripture of the, of the parables, or, or the, uh, the parable of the five of the talents in Matthew 25. And let me just kind of break this down for you. I won't read all the scripture, but there were, there were three men. The master, the owner, came to these three men, and he said, I want you to take care to steward, to manage over this while I'm gone. He gave one man five bags of money, five talents. He gave the second man two. He gave the third man one. And he said, take care of this, and I'll be back. Well, the first man had five bags of money, five talents. And while the master was gone, he put it to work. He was a good steward over it. He took care of it. It began to multiply. It began to increase. And when the master came back, he didn't just have five. Now he had ten. He had doubled what he had. Would you say that's a pretty good steward? Did he make wise decisions and good investment? The second man, he had two. And while the master was gone, he put his to work. And it began to multiply and it began to increase. And when the owner came back, he didn't have just two, he had four. But the third man, he had one. And he gave that one bag of money to him. 
And that servant, while the owner was gone, he decided that he was not going to do anything with it. So he dug a hole. He buried the money. He hid the money. He operated in fear. And when the owner of the master came back, he said, You are a lazy, wicked servant. And he took the one from him and gave to the one that now had ten. And that might seem unfair. You say, well, you took from the one. He only had just a little bit. But he didn't do anything with what he had. I've heard people say, well, if I had money, I'd write a check and pay off the church. If I had money, I'd pay somebody's house payment. Or I'd pay their car payment. I would do this. I would do that. What are you doing with what you have? Everybody has a little bit. And if you start where you are, being faithful with a little bit, God will bless and multiply and increase and give you more. I'll show you. Well, let me, before I do that, let me just mention, if you're wondering how much the bags of money were worth, how much a talent in the parable of the talents, how much is it worth? Well, I did a little research just to kind of find out in this day and age, if you translated how much the, the gold was worth, the talents were worth in Bible days until now. There was a range. And if you took a minimum of $7.25 an hour, minimum wage, multiplied it times 40 hours, one talent would be worth $300,000. But if you took about $500 a week and multiplied it, one talent would be worth over a million dollars, about five, 500, or I'm sorry, $500,000. So from 300 to 500. So if you had five talents worth 500,000, that's two and a half million dollars. And when he multiplied it and put it to work, he had 10. Now it's worth $5 million. The man that only had one bag of money, his was worth at least $300,000, probably $500,000. That's a lot to start with. So take what you have and do something with it. Let me give you the life application. Verse 29 in Matthew 25. Everyone who uses what they have will get more. They will have much more than they need. But people who do not use what they have will have everything taken away from them. So I told you today, we're going to have fun. We want to be blessed. You want to be blessed of God? Take what you have, put it to work, and watch what God will do with your finances. Several years ago, the Lord spoke to Reed and me. He spoke to me first. And we had just bought a brand new Suburban. $43,000, brand new off the lot. I had a 90-day note on that. And I had put $10,000 down, so I owed $33,000. And on a Sunday morning, the Lord spoke to me and he said, Give that van or that suburban to a man in our church. And I said, Lord, I still owe $33,000 on it. He said, That's okay, give it to him. I gave him that vehicle on that Sunday morning. He had started a new ministry, and it was a soul-winning ministry. The first weekend, they had like 140 people saved. It was a great ministry. And so we gave him that vehicle. I turned to Rita, and I told her what we're going to do. And she said, do it. She was in obedience. She was or in, in, uh, on the same page with me. And so we gave it away, and uh, I still owed $33,000. I didn't have the money to pay for it. It took me a little while to get it paid off. During that season, somebody else gave me another Suburban to drive that was paid for. Oh, you didn't hear me. Somebody gave me a Suburban. But the seed, when I gave away, when we gave away that vehicle, I didn't know why we were having to give it away. Reading it when she, we went into the house, and because I had it on a 90-day note, we had the title. She went in the house to get the title. The guy drove home with us, and he dropped us off. And uh, I told her to go in the house. She asked the Lord. She said, Lord, we don't mind doing this, but most of the time when you hear stories like this, the vehicle's already paid for. Paid for. Why are you requiring so much of us? And the Lord spoke very clear to her and said, because I'm going to bless you so much. Now, here's, here's what happened. We gave that away, and I knew. I didn't know it then, but when we got this building, this $5 million building on the airport exit, actually it's insured at $6 million now. When we got this building, I knew immediately the seed of that suburban was the seed that opened the door for us to have this building for this harvest. You wouldn't be sitting here today 
if we hadn't have given away that vehicle on that day? Was it hard to do? Yes, it was hard to do. But I did it in obedience, and we never looked back. So everyone who uses what they have get more. They will have much more than they need. But people who do not use what they have, everything will be taken away. Look at this verse. In Luke 6, 37 and 38, God expects generosity when he blesses us. Don't pick up, don't pick on people. Don't jump on their failures. Don't criticize their faults unless you want the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down. That hardness can boomerang. Be easy on people. You'll find life a lot easier. Give your life away. You'll find life given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. So God expects us to be generous with what we have because it's really not ours, it's His. It's only His. It's not ours. And when we do, He blesses us. But disobedience, if we don't obey Him, disobedience brings a curse. Verse 47 and 48 says this, That servant knew what his master wanted him to do, but he did not make himself ready or try to do what his master wanted him. Let me just pause and say, if you're a Christian, you know when God speaks to you. You know what God wants you to do. There's no doubt because we know his voice. It's just sometimes we don't obey him. So obey him because you know what God wants you to do. And if you don't, it said, so that servant will be punished very much. Whoever has been given much will be responsible for much, but much more will be expected from the one who has been given more. Malachi 3 says it like this. People should not steal things from God, but you stole from me, God said. You say, what did we steal from you? You should have given me one-tenth of your things. You should have given me special gifts. In this way, your whole nation has stolen things from me, so bad things are happening to you. Let me just pause here and say, when you take your tithe, and you send it to Africa, or Honduras, or Aunt Susie, or the neighbor two doors over that has a need, that's not tithing. It's not tithing. It's commendable. And it's okay if you give to, to Africa, or Honduras, or wherever, to Aunt Susie, or to the neighbor next door. Do that. Bless people. Do that. God will bless you for that. That's sowing seed. But that's not tithing. He said, bring the tithe into the storehouse. Here's what God said, the next part of that verse in Malachi. Try this test. Bring one-tenth of your tithes to me. Put them in the treasury. Bring food to my house. Test me. If you do these things, I will surely bless you. Good things will come to you like rain falling from the sky. Good things will come to you like rain falling from the sky. Good things will come to you like rain falling from the sky. You will have more than enough of everything. Why is it so hard for us to be obedient with the tithe? It's a dime out of every a dime out of every dollar. And when you give to him in obedience, God is going to open the windows of heaven like rain falling from the sky. He will bless you. You will have more than enough of everything. Trust fund. God has established a trust fund. You are the steward. He wants you to be obedient. If you're obedient, you get the blessings. If you're disobedient, you get the curse. It's, it's so easy. It's so simple. So, let's pray. Let's pray this prayer together. These are scriptures. We're going to pray the scripture. Psalm 119, 66. Psalm 143, 8. Let's do it together. Give me the knowledge to make wise decisions. I trust your commands. Psalm 119, 66. Show me your faithful love this morning. I trust in you. Show me what I should do. I put my life in your hands. Here's the promise. We're going to, pr we're going to pray this as a scripture. I can trust this. Every word that God speaks is true. God is a safe place for those who go to him. 
My God will use His glorious riches to give me everything I need. He will do this through Christ Jesus. Amen.